and chair of the Education Committee. I am joined today by Councillor Garrison, who is a sponsor of today's hearing, and will be joined by colleagues as the, as the hearing goes on. We'll in, uh, introduce them as they join us. I'd like to remind everyone that this is a public hearing being recorded and will be rebroadcast on Comcast 8, RCN 82, Verizon 1964, and online. I ask that you please silence your cell phones and other devices. We'll be taking public testimony and would appreciate that if you would sign in and indicate that you wish, wish to testify. Uh, please, when you do testify or when you join us for the panel, uh, panel presentation, please state your name and affiliation or residence if you're testifying publicly uh, and limit your comments during public, te public testimony to a few minutes uh, to ensure that all comments and concerns are heard. Uh, this hearing is for he uh, docket number 0248, an order for a hearing to discuss the need for more civics education in our Boston Public Schools beyond the current minimal, minimal half-year requirement. We'll be hearing from the Boston Public Schools and the Massachusetts Department of Higher Ed today. I look forward to learning more uh, about civics curriculum in our schools uh, and from those that are presenting. I will uh, just for the record and for information for those listening at home in the panel here today, um, share that I'm a former high school teacher in Boston and um, really interested in sort of the work before us. I have four um, children in the seventh and eighth grade, so they'll be preparing for their high school education in particular, and I'm interested in uh, the requirements for civic education for them and what to expect as a parent, um, what we have now and where we could improve access uh, to this curriculum. At this point, I uh, welcome the lead sponsor of today's hearing, Councilor Garrison, to share her comments. Councilor Garrison. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to begin by thanking Councilor Isaba George, who chairs the Education Committee, for her support and for scheduling this hearing order that I filed at the end of January. Many of you know that this is the first hearing order that I filed since being inaugurated on the City Council on January 9th. And I think that speaks to my steadfast commitment to education in our city, especially as it regards civic education for our youth. I would like to thank our panelists who join us today, Mrs. Natasha Scott, Director of History and Social Studies for the Boston Public Schools, and Dr. John Reef, Director of Civic Learning Engagement for the Massachusetts Department of Public Education, Higher Education, uh, and, and Charles Grandson. We are blessed uh, to have these subject matters experts with us today. I would also like to recognize the presence of Samantha Perlman, uh, who joins us in the chambers today with some of her colleagues from Generation Citizens Generation Citizens work to ensure that every student in the United States receive an effective action, civic education, which provides them with knowledge and skills necessary to participate in our democracy as active citizens. Thank you, Samantha, Generation Citizens. I filed this order for our hearing to discuss collaboration with our City Hall Education Cabinet the Boston Public Schools, and leaders in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to consider changing our half-year mandatory civics class requirement to at least a year. While this is a very specific recommendation, my hope is that today we will afford an opportunity to speak generally about the need to highlight the, the importance of civics education in our Boston Public Schools looking at what has gone well and brainstorming for how we can do better. As I mentioned in my hearing order, according to Center of American Progress, only nine states and the District of Columbia requires one year of U.S. government of civics, Massachusetts and Boston by extension, not being one of them. 31 states only require half year of civics for U.S. government education of which Massachusetts is included. While federal education policy has focused on improving academic achievement in reading and math, this has come at the expense of broader curriculum. 
Most states and local school districts have dedicated insufficient class time to understand the basic function of government at the expense of other courses. State civics curriculum are often heavy on knowledge, but light on building skills and, ag and agency for civic engagement, an example of standards of far civics and US government courses, found that 32 states and the District of Columbia provided the most basic instruction on American democracy. In comparison to other systems of government, the history of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, an explanation of me mechanism for public participation and instruction on state and local voting policies. Many states have no experimental learning to local problem solving. Components expounded upon in their civic requirement. This is relevant to our own city of Boston and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. At this present, at this present November, the Baker administration signed into law an act to promote and enhance civic en engagement, which aim at improving civic education in Massachusetts. The core tenet of the law basically requires offering middle school and high school students the chance to voluntarily participate in a student-led civic project, either individually or in a group. As a former state representative, I truly appreciate the legislative action, and it was a positive step forward, but in my opinion, the city of Boston can do better. My focus isn't just offering the possibility for more civic projects, but to offer more curriculum and instructions on civics in our Boston public school classrooms. Additionally, the Annenberg Public Policy Center of the University of Pennsylvania cites these staggering statistics. More than half of Americans, 53 percent incorrectly, think it is accurate to say that immigrants who are here illegally do not have any rights under the U.S. Constitution. More than a third of these surveyed, 37 percent, can't name any of the rights guaranteed under the First Amendment. Only a quarter of Americans, 26%, can name all three branches of government. I think it is important to note that the current events in our country and recent national elections only highlight how important it is that we educate and instruct our young people about how government ought to work, given our rich history and the goal of progress that we all share. Getting our young people in Boston excited about government can shape and form their hearts and minds to be civically engaged and to perhaps even inspire them to consider becoming public servants in the future. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and I'm grateful for this conversation. Thank you, Councillor uh, Garrison. We've also been joined by Councillor Siomo, uh, Councillor O'Malley, and Councillor Flynn. Do either of you, any of you have an opportunity just, for? Just a quick. I uh, just wanted to thank the at-large counselor for bringing uh, this subject up, especially in light of us uh, building momentum for 16-year-olds to vote. We want to make sure that they're informed uh, at an early age of the Bill of Rights and so many of the things that the good counselor just mentioned. So thank you. And Councilor O'Malley, welcome. Thank Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, too, want to add my uh, voice to thanking Councillor Garrison for bringing this before. Uh, as an alumnus of the Boston Public Schools, I remember being fortunate enough to taking a full year of civics curriculum in the eighth grade, I believe. Um, and I also got to participate in the close-up program, which is a week-long government studies program where members of this, we had to raise $1,000 for scholarship. And uh, I remember writing a letter to every city councilor at that time, and uh, several of them, not all, but several of them uh, were kind enough to support those efforts. Obviously, this is something that I'm incredibly Would you like to about. share with us who did, who did uh, I'll say I'll save that for the committee report. Uh, no one who is currently serving. <laughs> Maybe some that used to be serving in the not-too-distant past. But um, no, I'm just uh, grateful again to Councilor Garrison. Anything we can do to make this reality and strengthen this support for our young people uh, is just a very promising initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor O'Malley. And Councilor Flynn, welcome. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. And to um, Council Garrison, um, thank you both for your leadership on, on this important issue. And um, I, I support the proposal to 
add civics as part of our um, subjects in the Boston Public School System. Um, just as a, uh, on a side note, I had the opportunity when my son was at the Josiah Quincy School to be a chaperone and the school went up to Suffolk University to participate in a program about the United Nations and they learned about climate change and they learned about um, our environment and they also were learning about civics as well. So anytime we have the opportunity to expose our students in the Boston Public School System to um, civics is, is something I, I definitely support. So I just want to say thank you to um, Council Garrison, Council Asabi George, to the uh, Boston Public School System as well for um, strong leadership on this issue. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Um, so I do want to turn it over to our panel. I'm not sure who would like to go first, if there's a particular order. Uh, but the floor it's, it's is okay. yours. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, um, Councillor Garrison and Chair Asabi George. Um, I'm delighted uh, to be here today. Uh, I'm Charles Granson, Chief Academic Officer for Boston Public Schools. Um, and uh, as a former history teacher myself, I'm thrilled about the opportunity that the recent, recent uh, civics law provides um, to our young people in order to give them with the, the tools they need to be informed actors in their communities, uh, municipal, municipalities, state and federal government. Um, <clears throat> this is also consistent with our um, city of Boston college and career and life readiness framework in terms of uh, preparing uh, independent learners who are ready to go off into life and to participate uh, in society. Um, and uh, we have uh, uh, here today uh, Natasha Scott, our Director of History and Social Studies, who I'm delighted to turn things over to. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, counselors. Um, I'm very excited to just kind of lay out what is happening currently in Boston Public Schools, um, talk about some of the programmings that we have, and really just give a full sense of what civic education looks like currently in Boston. And so I always think it's essential to think about um, the voice of our students. So as the next generation, it is important to understand and actively participate in directing our country in a positive way. So that's one of our student poll workers, their reflection after participating in our program in 2017. So when we think about civic education for Boston Public School, we want to make sure that we are acknowledging the knowledge, skills, and dispositions of our students and the, their ability to engage with not just the content, but understand what it means to be an active and engaged and informed member of our democracy. So we want them building those civic knowledge, skills, and dispositions, also thinking about how their personal identity affects how their, their thoughts and their thinking and establishing meaningful relationships with community organizations. So seeing themselves in the process and seeing their relationship with other organizations in the process. Um, and understanding that those diverse perspectives, okay, as one of the counselors had earlier mentioned, going not just to our local perspectives, but our relationship as a global citizen as well. And then the, the importance of participating. So when we think about, sorry, that's a little tiny up there, but as we think about um, the history of civic education in Boston since the last, so the last curriculum framework was passed, was adopted in 2003, but since then we've had opportunities to establish an eighth grade civics um, course. We've had the opportunity, so we've had the eighth grade civics course. We have done the uh, a participatory action research course that was a, an elective at a time for 12th grade around 2012. And then we then um, develop the Boston Civics Collaborative where we have many partner organizations who come together to talk about the state of civic education now, how can we can collaborate to help continue to move that forward. And as we progress, we can see where we've had the new adoptions in the framework and we have the new legislation. So now we have this momentum and these structures to help guide us. So when we think about those structures in terms of what civic learning looks like right now, we have our history and social studies framework that was just adopted in June 2018. And within those frameworks, we have the content, so not just content standards, but content standards, practice standards, and literacy standards. Understanding that civics and history and social study education cuts across all of those realms. It is no longer just can you memorize historic facts and facts about our government but do you know how to engage in them? Okay. Do you know how to participate? We also have, as was previously mentioned, the civic legislation that was passed in November, mandating those action civics projects in middle school and high school. And when we think about that, also thinking about 
um, voter registration drives, and those different elements that we've started to incorporate, but we look forward to expanding across the district. And finally, when we think about civics and history and social studies instruction overall, um, we think about just elements of effective history and social studies instruction. So that rich content, historical thinking skills, and place-based learning. We don't want just our students to be able to memorize things and spit them back out, but understand how to analyze question process, as well as understanding the importance of place being in the city of Boston and having our students here with the amount of history that we have available to us right in our neighborhoods, really taking the responsibility to get out of our classrooms and utilize the city as a classroom. <clears throat> so when we think specifically about civic learning in Boston Public Schools, there we go, sorry about that. Um, we think about essential aligned instruction in the classroom, we think about place-based learning, and authentic learning experiences. So as I dive into some examples of some of that work that's happening, we want to make sure that um, civic learning cuts across all of those. We don't want just the same old, same old. This is really an opportunity to, for us to leverage um, all of the different structures in place now. So when we think about civic education, we really want to make sure that we're starting. We, uh, so in my position, I think about uh, history and social studies, K-12, and really making sure that our civic learning starts at our, with our youngest learners. So in the past uh, several years, we've collaborated with Discovering Justice to integrate the Discovering Justice curriculum completely into the focus on K-2. Um, we've had, so they've um, raised grant funds for us to collaborate um, with teacher professional development, provide curriculum materials, as well as providing that place-based learning of actually going to the John D. Moakley Courthouse for a tour and a mock trial. So, which is, when you think about it at our youngest level, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, um, which is just the civic engagement there is just amazing. Um, we've had, a, I want to say, approximately 160 teachers who have uh, collaborated with Discovering Justice to get those experiences. When we think about that place-based learning, um, in the last two years, we've, we want to make sure, when we think about that place-based learning, we want to make sure that we're including both content and practice so that they get the opportunity to learn the rich history, uh, civic history that we see in Boston, as well as how to engage civically. So one of the experiences that we've been collaborating with the State House on um, recently in the last two years is Civic Engagement Day on the Hill. And with that, we have uh, one eighth grade, between eighth grade to 10th grade classroom that goes to uh, the State House on one, I think it's the second Wednesday of the month. And with that, they get the opportunity to speak with legislators, to get a tour, to practice a simulation hearing. So they get to t debate topics um, in this experience. Is, and that's, we collaborate with the Massachusetts Caucus for Black and Latino Caucus. So our students are getting the opportunity to engage with legislators and staff who look like them as they're in these experiences. And when we also think about those place-based learning, we think about the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the U.S. Senate, where they get to go out. They're um, getting to be senators for the day. Uh, we think about our relationship with the National Park Service and their opportunity to go and explore the historic information that we're going to find in the different neighborhoods. And then when we think about those authentic learning experiences, we've been collaborating with the City of Boston uh, Elections Department to create that student poll worker program. Uh, we started the program in 2017, and with that, the students work both the primary and the general election. Um, and some, we have some students that just work one or the other, um, but they get to participate in the election. They work from the arriving of the ballots and the opening of the ballots and spend the entire day um, getting that full experience of working the polls. Uh, we've had, over the last two years, we've had a total of 101 students participating in the program, and to participate in that program, you just have to be 16 years old and above, um, and they participate in the same training that our poll workers do for the city, um, as well as getting paid for any time that's out outside of school hours, um, which is a fabulous opportunity for them as well. Um, and with that, this year we also uh, ran some voter registration drives, so that was a new addition to that program this year, um, really to think about how we can empower our students who decide that they want to be poll workers and how we empower them to then continue the work in their, in their buildings. Um, another great experience that we had this year uh, with our Gilder Lerman program in Hamilton. So we had about uh, 2,100 students who had the opportunity to go see Hamilton, but it wasn't just to go participate and enjoy the show. They actually had to do research. They had to learn, they had to write their own performance pieces 
in to order to engage and really think and analyze this content. So making sure that we're getting out of the box and giving our students these more creative opportunities and authentic learning experiences within Boston. Um, when we think about that student voice piece, so we think about that new legislation with that mandate for civic education and action civics projects in both middle school and high school. So we've been coll uh, collaborating with several organizations. So we have Generation Citizen that we've been working with that's working in several of our schools right now. And with that, it's professional development for the teachers, getting to learn how how to run an action civics project in our classroom. We know that project-based learning is a shift in instruction, and so we really want to make sure that we're supporting teachers in that process. And uh, we've also been collaborating with iCivics, so um, last spring, late spring, early summer, um, we were able to get a grant with iCivics to, again, help support project that uh, action civics piece, as well as having, uh, in integrating that digital learning component, that the digital gaming piece. Um, so we have several schools that are participating now, but again, we, we look forward to getting more schools on board and, and involved as we continue to um, implement the new legislation. And reinforcing the importance of civics and civic education from local to global understanding that it doesn't just stop here, but you have a larger relationship with the world. Um, so we have our, starting with our local, our Boston Student Advisory Council, so we collaborate with them in terms of um, learning how to do elections. So for student government, for uh, students who are going to be representing the school on school site councils. Um, we also have a relationship with the United Nations of Greater Boston Association, and with them, as Councillor, F Councillor Flynn had mentioned, um, with with them, our students are getting the opportunity to engage as uh, in the program. So we have several schools doing that, and we have a few others to just participate in their conference. And finally, we have our Global Scholars Program that we have a few schools running in the sixth and seventh grade, and that program allows them to engage with other students around the world. So it's a, it's a digital platform. They have the opportunity to work on a pro it's project based learning. This year's topic is water. Last year's topic was food scarcity. Um, so every year is a new topic, and they get to engage with other members from around the world and have conversations in terms of how those issues that play out in their, in their locations, in their regions. And so then when we think specifically about the civic courses in Boston, we see that that course sequence, we have that eighth grade course right now as, a, as written in the framework um, that's now statewide. So Boston, as I mentioned earlier, has been doing that eighth grade civics course for quite a while. Um, and now we have the opportunity to be a step ahead, which is wonderful. It's a wonderful feeling. And now it's revising to align to the new framework standards in eighth grade. So uh, we see that live there explicitly. We also see as, and when we think about the number of students that are participating currently, and we, we have about 49 schools that are offering that eighth grade civics, uh, an eighth grade course right now. So we have civics, some do it through a humanities model. We have some schools that incorporate through different electives as well. So we have debate, mock and, debate and mock trial. Some have a participate in a law and justice elective. And, so there's a variety of ways it's presented, but as we look at the key topics that are there, we can see that it's foundations of government, but also it gets to how to engage in voting. There we go. The Constitution and amendments, and one of the great attributes that's in our new framework that we're looking forward to adding to that eighth grade civics course is that news and media literacy, including freedom of press. Um, those are different elements that we wanna make sure that our kids are knowledgeable and participating. Uh, when we think about our high school civics, it's integrated into, currently it is integrated into US 1 and US 2, and you can see through the topics that are listed there where the connection for civic education is happening. Um, we do have several schools that provide a civic elective that specifically focuses on civics topics. So when you think about American foreign policy, American government, AP American government, AP human geography, some uh, in the past, we, with, in 2012, when we had that participatory action research course, uh, we have some schools who still run that under the title of Civics Boston Youth Empower and also Research and Activism for Change. So we have different pockets participating and engaging in that um, high school elect elective for civic education. And when we think about next steps, 
and where we want to go. Um, it's important for us to continue collaborating. This is, this is challenging work and we wanna make sure that we're not doing it alone and that we're pulling in different organizations that can provide insight in terms of content best practices. Um, so our Boston Civics Collaborative, uh, we have the boss, the, we have BSAC, Discovering Justice, the EMK Institute, we have Facing History and Ourselves, Generation Citizen, iCivics, Primary Source, Sociedad Latina, the Democratic Knowledge Project at Harvard, and the United Nations um, organizations in Boston. So we're, we continue to meet bi-monthly, um, and with that, those conversations are what should instruction look like? What are the resources that we have to align to really get us moving forward together rather than everyone doing something separate? And when we think about the timeline um, for implementation, we are continuing to, to strengthen kind of what's happening in middle school right now. <clears throat> so we're pulling together teacher work groups to work on that sixth, seventh, and eighth grade sequence. Um, and from there, what we're going to also be doing is thinking about how those action civics projects play out in middle school and high school. What should they look like? What should the characteristics be? Where is it going to be integrated in high school? Um, whether it becomes a standalone course, whether it becomes part of that US 1, US 2. And just to close out in a final thought, um, our youth is the forefront of our future. They're going to be the ones who create the tone of what our government looks like, what our cities look like, and especially what our classrooms look like for the next generation to modify. If we include civic education into the foundation, then they will be able to make major steps within their futures, and the adults would be able to learn some things too. That's coming from one of our uh, seniors, seniors from BLA, a BSAC member who spoke at our Civics Expo um, this last August. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you very much. And then if, if you would like to um, do your opening remarks and then we'll, we'll start yes. circulating for questions from the counselors. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'd like to begin by expressing my appreciation to Councillor Garrison and to the council for um, focusing on this critically important issue of civic education. Um, and my appreciation to my colleagues from the Boston Public Schools for what you're already doing. Uh, it is uh, terribly important for us as a society. So uh, I'd like to say just who I am and what it is that I do in relation to civic learning. Uh, just a little bit and then uh, turn it back to the larger group. So I'm John Reif. I uh, have spent about 40 years as a faculty member and then as an administrator in higher education focusing on civic learning and civic engagement and um, doing the teaching of civic learning and civic engagement and then supporting other faculty in doing the same. I came to Massachusetts in 2000 to direct uh, the office which is now called Civic Engagement and Service Learning at UMass Amherst. And then in 2015, I moved into my current position with the Massachusetts Department of Higher Education as Director of Civic Learning and Engagement for Public Higher Education. So the perspective I bring to you is a higher education perspective, which I think needs to be partnering in all kinds of creative ways with pre-K through 12. The, the agency for which I work, the Massachusetts Department of Higher Education, is the state agency that supports the Board of Higher Education and helps our public campuses implement policies uh, passed by the board. Uh, the board and the department have oversight in some way for all of higher education in Massachusetts, but particularly a strong oversight for the community colleges and the state universities. And in 2014, the board passed a policy on civic learning, which made Massachusetts the first state in the nation to call on its public colleges and universities to involve all of their undergraduates in civic learning. And um, some of you have a handout that has a brief um, sketch of that policy. Uh, I'll be happy to share that uh, with anyone who doesn't have it. The policy 
has um, a number of things that I think are really important. The first is a definition of civic learning. Because there are a lot of definitions. What is civic learning? So for the Board of Higher Education, and therefore for public higher education in Massachusetts, um, we see civic learning as acquiring the knowledge, the intellectual skills, and the practical competencies or practical skills that citizens need for informed and effective participation in civic and democratic life. But it doesn't stop there. It also involves acquiring an understanding of the social and political values that underlie democratic structures and practices. So doing civic learning in the way the Board of Higher Ed uh, has framed it, you're thinking about what you need to know, but you're also thinking about what you need to know how to do, and you're, pra you're developing the practice of doing that. Uh, and you're also, and that doing is both intellectual and practical. So how do you, how do you think critically about an argument that someone's making about something that should be done? And what kinds of questions might you ask about that? That's the intellectual, one of the intellectual skills. Uh, how do you engage with someone across differences so that you can seek uh, perhaps a shared solution to a common problem? That's a practical skill, which is also intellectual. So uh, it's a complex definition that allows people doing this work to do it in a lot of different ways and those different ways then need to fit together. So as director of civic learning and engagement, uh, I've been working basically in six areas with public higher ed here in the Commonwealth. I've been helping our campuses develop systems by which they designate courses that have a substantial civic learning component with any one of those four elements that I just named or all of them. I've been developing tools that faculty can use to assess student civic learning outcomes. What is it they're actually learning? And we're working to build tools that faculty can use. Uh, because our state legislature has limited the funding available to support this, I have been searching for external funding to pass on to the campuses to support them in building capacity to do civic learning. And I've been providing opportunities for faculty and staff to engage in professional development to figure out how to build these courses that will have uh, a civic learning focus. I've also been working with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed in seeking to build a seamless framework from pre-K through 16. Um, the Board of Higher Ed and the Board of Elementary and Secondary Ed um, took their joint agreement on college and career readiness and added to it um, the goal of civic preparation, K to 16, or pre-K to 16. And um, then I've uh, worked with uh, Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed on the curriculum framework that Natasha just referred to. Uh, and in some of the training of teachers uh, who will be doing the eighth grade civics classes and other civic education throughout the curriculum. And then the, the last big thing that I do is where I can tell the story of what is still a very well-kept secret that Massachusetts has an expectation that all of its students in public higher ed will be involved in civic learning. Um, so what I've seen as I've been doing this work is the creation of this framework that links us together with pre-K through 12 and that links the campuses together to design ways for students to get this kind of experience. The existence of this framework allows those who work on in our campuses who care about it to have support. I think that's one of the most important things, that uh, people who care about civic learning 
no longer have to say, well, I care about it. I'm going to do it anyway. They can say, the state wants me to do it. And so therefore, I'm helping our campus meet the state's expectation when I do it. Um, I have seen the emergence of exciting models on various campuses. For instance, at Salem State, there's been uh, a strong focus on bringing together the curriculum and the co-curriculum around civic learning. And one of the ways that's happened is during the 2016 election, there were courses that invited speakers in to talk about the ballot issues. And then the campus through student affairs invited the whole campus to come and participate in those public talks. And so it was course-based and it was co-curricular at the same time. Uh, there are a lot of interesting ways that uh, people on the campuses have been building capacity for that. And one other thing that I've seen is that when students on our campuses participate in civic engagement, that has been shown to be strongly linked to their retention in college across semesters and their completion of degree programs at significantly higher percentages than the other students who don't have the civic engagement experience. And so it's not hard to imagine why that might be. If you're doing meaningful civic engagement, you see yourself making a difference in the place where you live. And you can get excited about that. And you have a reason then to come back and do more. So I think, um, I think a lot has already been said about um, what this work needs to look like. I'll just add two more points and then pass it back to you. The first is uh, the idea of partnerships. Natasha spoke about a whole range of partnerships that uh, Boston Public Schools are already engaged in. And I would want to encourage you to both continue with those and uh, look to your local public higher ed institutions as civic partners, civic learning partners. Um, particularly at um, Bunker Hill Community College and at MassArt, there is an infrastructure in place to do um, civic learning with the college students. And one of the ways they could do their civic learning is to partner with K through 12 classes and be engaged in the learning of the kids. And so, and I'd be happy to connect you with those people. Um, the other um, thing I would just want to underscore, and this has already been said, so I'm just singing it again. When we think about civic learning, it's not pouring important facts into supposedly empty heads. It's sharing knowledge, but also addressing relevance and agency. It's uh, helping students see how that knowledge matters to their lives, what it is, and what it is they might do with that knowledge to make a real difference in their lives and in the community that they're part of. And so building that sense of agency that I can actually make a difference in my community, I can participate in the decisions that govern the society that I'm part of um, is uh, at least as important as getting the facts. You do need the facts to be able to make that difference. So thank you for inviting me to speak to you today, and I hope to find ways to continue to partner with the Boston Public Schools. Great. Thank you, Dr. Reif, uh, and thank you all for your presentation today. What I'll do is uh, we'll open it up to uh, questions from my colleagues. I'd like to start. Uh, we'll do about a five-minute timer for the first round of questions, and I'd like to start with uh, the lead sponsor, Councilor Garrison. Um, Dr. Reif. In your experience, do you see a need for more classroom curriculum and instruction as it regard to civic education? Absolutely, I do. 
I could go on about that if you want, but uh, I'll stop there. Uh, Ms. Scott, is it, um, is it possible that we could require a year or more of civics education in our Boston Public Schools? And if you can, please explain the process by which that kind of proposal could be put forth con for consideration. So right now we see that uh, civic education embedded within the curriculum, uh, within the state framework, currently there's a requirement for three years of history and social studies. So, it, so that's where kind of the civics lives right now. Um, but if we think about expanding that, thinking about what electives, what else we can include at a 12th grade level to get that opportunity. And I would just add to that that I, I think a lot of um, uh, the excitement around uh, the new law uh, provides a great opportunity for us to go back and, and work internally to try to figure out, uh, work with teachers, work with school leaders, um, uh, work with the superintendent, school committee, and mayor's office to figure out sort of a, a long-term strategic plan about how we um, roll out and build up over time um, our civics offering. Um, we have, uh, for the most part in Boston Public Schools, we, we try to uh, promote a culture of uh, school autonomy for leaders to be able to create the environment necessary um, for their local conditions and context, but we do um, you know, provide parameters and, for example, um, these uh, recently the superintendent rolled out um, high school working groups one of which was about mass core and graduation requirements and so as a part of that conversation I think um, looking at civics education is an important piece um, this question is for dr. Reith and mrs. Scott our studies have shown that democracy depends on political participation but young people are turning away from politics and now we are caught in a vicious cycle as it regards education in the city of Boston, how can we change that reality? Sure. Um, so I think part of that, that participation, that engagement, when we think about these action civics projects and the way they're designed, really giving them the student, having that student-led piece, okay? We wanna make sure that the students are in a position where they feel that they can promote and have conversations about topics that they're passionate about, that affect their community. So then they can see that action play out over time. Um, I think that's, that's our ideal situation, that we want to make sure that we're empowering that. But with that, it also goes with supporting teachers so that they feel that comfort and security to have those conversations in the classroom. I would add to that, uh, that looking toward the partnerships that you have and can continue to develop uh, as a framework for these projects can be very important. I had the opportunity l last summer to hear from both the teacher and several students in a class at Lowell High School about that's supported, that's part of Generation Citizen work. And um, they developed an action civics project that had the students uh, organizing a gun buyback program in the city of Lowell. And um, the students had to talk to the police chief, to the county sheriff, to uh, nonprofits, to a whole range of different community stakeholders who would care about reducing the number of guns in the general population to create this project that ended up um, buying back with grocery store credits uh, 38 guns, including five assault rifles from the same person. Um, and they learned how to work collectively uh, with the infrastructure that exists in the larger community. And you know that kind of thing is great. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Garrison. Uh, we've also been joined by Councilor McCarthy. Councilor McCarthy, do you have any uh, questions right now? Thank you, uh, Councilor McCarthy. We were also joined by Councilor Campbell, who has stepped out. I have a few questions um, just on the PowerPoint, on the presentation today. It's very thorough and um, certainly very helpful. Um, I know that there's the partnership with the State House and Civic Stay on Beacon Hill. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we can maybe work post this hearing 
on an effort to make sure that we're uh, reflecting that or mirroring, mirroring some of that effort here at City Hall. We have the youth and BSAC kids and other student groups um, that come and interact with us frequently, but to have that more formal interaction I think would be really helpful and I'd, I'd want at any future presentation to be able to say that we're doing that here at City Hall. I think that um, I definitely welcome that collaboration to do that. Um, we really supported them in the design of the ex student experience because I think it's, in, it's essential because to understand the, what our students need to be engaging with when they're here. So we're more than happy to sit down and kind of think about what that experience could look like in City Hall in terms of having conversations with counselors, having conversations with different departments, even just getting familiar with the place itself. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank yeah, you for that. That'd be great. And then on the um, core course sequence um, slide, I think it's page 16 maybe, mm -hmm. um, there, when I think about the high school curriculum piece, I know that we're working um, towards a four-year sequence. What is the, what's the high school graduation requirement today in Boston? Currently, it's three years. It's three years. It's passing three years of history? Yes. Or of these history classes? Mm -hmm. And if a student doesn't pass three years, they're taking summer school? Right. Mm -hmm. So there are extended learning opportunities for um, history, the core courses. Great. Yeah. And then, um, do you happen to know the average age of the texts that are being used in these different courses? I do not have that information, but I can definitely get that. Because I, I imagine that some schools have newer curriculum, um, whereas I know uh, from my experiences teaching sometimes the texts, <laughs> although we think when we, when we talk about history that the, the age of the text doesn't matter because mm -hmm. it's history, yeah. um, we do know that the content um, mm -hmm. is often, um, not, not necessarily uh, reflective of what the, the history is that we should be teaching in our classes. So I would be interested in the average age um, or maybe some sample ages of our curriculum ac across the district. And then there's um, a lot of conversation here or a, a, a large listing, and I appreciate it, of AP offerings when it comes to civics education, history education, government education. And I appreciate the number of students that are exposed on this slide. This is slide 19. And the number of schools offering the courses. Can you, in particular to high school education, because that's where AP happens, mm -hmm. can you tell me um, how many school, how many of all the high schools in Boston, how many of them have access to AP courses when it comes to civic education? Hmm. So in terms of. And what do we have 33 high schools in Boston? Yes. So out of those, so out of the 29 schools, all of these would be high school courses. In terms of the specific AP breakdown. Oh, I'm sorry, it's listed here, I missed yeah. that. So of the 33 high schools in Boston, 20 of, 29 of them have access to exactly. AP courses. That's great. And where, I, would, I'm, I apologize, I missed that <laughs> on the slide. Um, so that's excellent. Obviously, I'd love to see those final four have access um, to some AP offering. I, where I would be um, interested then on the sort of the next question from that is of those 29 schools, and ideally we'd work to have 33, mm -hmm. um, how many of them are just having one opportunity or two opportunities versus you know, some of the schools that may have access to almost all of these mm -hmm. opportunities, mm -hmm. make sure that we're sort of spreading the, um, the opportunity to access this curriculum far and wide within our district. And then, can we talk a little bit about where kids are scoring on the AP exam um, based on these courses? Do we have any of that information? How successful are our kids at not just receiving the content, but then performing on the AP test, which I know can help them in college? Yeah, that's definitely something we're looking closely at, and um, we can get back to you with more data on that. Absolutely. And how are, how are they funded, the AP courses or the test piece? Because I know that's a separate budget item. Um, another area we can look at, I know a lot of um, uh, funding uh, come, came through a partnership we had with uh, Mass Insight, um, yeah. and there's been some changes recently, so we can get back to you um, with the exact sources. And we're preparing for our budget cycle here, so I think that'd be an interesting mm -hmm. sort of item to look at when we think mm -hmm. about our spending. And I'm not, I'm not, um, suggesting that we shouldn't be spending that money. I want to know that we're spending it and we're getting the return on the investment for our kids as, as needed. 
And then my last um, question here is, you know, as a district, we talked about a lot about build BPS and grade reconfigurations and going to a K to six, K to eight, nine to 12, seven to 12 model. There was um, some comment about the sixth, seventh and eighth grade sequencing of some of the middle school courses. Mm -hmm. Have we, Has this been reflected at all in the conversations with reconfiguration when schools are gonna, <coughs> and again, I support that. It's mm -hmm. you know, just curious that we're being mindful when we are working towards reconfiguring our schools mm -hmm. that we're considering the sequencing in civics education and history education. Mm -hmm. So, um, It'll come on. Is it on? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Go. Um, uh, is yes. Um, so um, uh, part of the work uh, that my team does with uh, asset across academics uh, is working with the operations team and our sort of larger Bill BPS team to, to do that kind of planning. So um, we have a larger Bill BPS team, which I sit on as chief academic officer. And then we also have um, a subcommittee that looks at building base. So what are the foundational things that are needed in schools academically um, to make sure that we, we build in that way and plan in that way as well. Um, and looking at the pathways, whether they be K6, 7, 12, uh, or um, K8, 9, 9, 12. So we are doing that work. And then uh, with, Dr. with Dr. Reif, how, where are the universities, um, what are they looking for in prospective students when it comes to civics education? And what are the, th what are the measurables, what are the sort of meaningful experiences that they want college applicants to have for acceptance? That's an excellent question. I wish I had a good answer for it, but I'm, I'm not sure that I do. Um, the expectation that the Department of Higher Ed has passed on to the campuses uh, has really been received by the academic side of the house and the student affairs side of the house. And I think how deeply that has been transmitted to the admissions side of the house is really going to vary campus to campus because that's not something that we control from the Department of Higher Ed. Um, I know that there are several campuses that have really taken a civic engagement and civic education uh, commitment deeply into, the, or have woven it deeply into the fabric of the campus. And for those campuses, uh, I think they would be looking for students who have, um, can demonstrate not only have they participated in civic engagement or action civics projects, but they've been really thoughtful about it and they've integrated that into their sense of self. Um, and there probably are other campuses that have not yet made that connection in their own entrance process. Thank you very it's much. It's a moving target. It is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The whole college application process is. Yeah, yeah. It is, well thank you very much for your, um, for your presentation, your thought, Council Garrison. Do you have any follow-up questions prior to public testimony? Uh, no, I don't. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I appreciate, and, and you're welcome to stay for public testimony, either here okay. on the panel or if you'd like to um, step aside, but I will call uh, for public testimony. Uh, again, you have a few moments to testify if you'd identify yourself um, in either your affiliation or residence. So as they start clearing their table and moving, um, we have two, uh, oper two mics for public testimony. I'll invite uh, Mike Wasserman up, as well as Molly Morrison. And then on sort of double double deck there will be Elizabeth Sanchez and Samantha Perlman. Welcome, Mike. And if you want to just wait a quick minute, let Natasha clear herself out. Dr. Reif, that'd be great. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you all for, uh, thank you Councillor Garrison and, um, and all for hosting this. Uh, my name is Mike Wasserman, I'm the Executive Director of the Boston Debate League. Um, just as, as quick context, we're a, we're a nonprofit organization that's been in the city for about 13 years um, and have partnered with the Boston Public Schools and with the city very closely. Um, we run uh, debate uh, programs in about 40 of the 75 
uh, schools and BPS that run middle and high school programs, uh, run middle and high school grades. We have about 800 to 1,000 students a year that are engaging in our uh, debate programs. And while for the most part we're not running programs during the debate programs during the school day, although we are in, in a, a small subset of our schools, maybe five to 10, um, I think what we've learned from our work in the after school space and with about you know, the thousand students a year that we're working with is that um, this engagement with civics and not in a kind of content based, book based way, but really in a student driven, uh, action oriented way is, is often one of the most engaging ways that students are able to work in, in an educational context. And so um, it's the reason that, that I wanted to come here and we wanted to come here today and just uh, put our, uh, our endorsement in any kind of increase in civic engagement um, and civic education that happens in the Boston Public Schools. I appreciate during the presentation the focus on not just information and not just content, but on skills and on student agency and on student-led learning. I think sometimes there is such a focus on curriculum, um, and, and we know this from our work with schools and teachers. Um, we know teachers often will say that I have so much curriculum to get through, so much content to get through, that I, I realize I'm just blowing by um, the things that students really want to engage in. And what, and what happens is that you have students that um, are not just capable of engaging and becoming um, active learners in the school and even leaders in their school, um, that they can drive the work forward. BPS talks about things like um, culturally and linguistically sustaining practices. And one of the ways that you do that is really having students play a leading role. But when you have so much content focus, um, I think you find students that, um, that leave, leave their education, whether in a physical way or in just an engagement way. And so what we've seen in the power of debate in an after-school setting, but we're excited to see it in, in school-based settings with BPS and Generation Citizens and others, is that it actually pulls students back in because it gives them credit for um, their intellect, for their ability to drive conversations. And so just as an example, the way that we run our debate programming is that over the course of the year, we'll pick one large policy topic. So this year we have 1,000 students across Boston that are learning about immigration policy. But we give students the autonomy and the authority to choose how to zone in on that, whether they're talking about the experience of a refugee coming to the country, whether it's the experience of work visas, or, or even the freedom to take something that's a broad topic like that and, and own the kind of specific, how does that impact me specifically? So we have a, a group of students that are talking about how um, federal policies, be it immigration or others, impact their experience with black women in Boston, in the public schools. And they have the ability to take their education in that direction. And while they, each student in our program learns a different piece of content, I would say that those students are some of the most engaged, not just in the schools, but in the city. And so what we've seen is that um, students that engage in the Boston Debate League are the ones that are serving in BSAC. They are the students that have led school walkouts and engaged with this council in the Boston Public Schools funding. Um, debaters were the students that were leading the protests um, in Copley uh, after the Muslim ban. Uh, we have a student recently that led her school in changing a policy that banned head wraps on women and explained and, and took an active role in educating the school leadership of the biases that were built into that policy and why that shouldn't be there. And so, um, you know, that's, that, those are our specific um, impacts that we see from the community that, that we've worked with of, of students and teachers across BPS, but I think we just see that power and the more that that can be brought into um, school context, whether it's in a school day setting or whether it's acknowledging and giving students credit for the work they do after school and on weekends, um, there's a lot of power in that. So we appreciate uh, you all having this conversation and uh, glad, glad to be a part of it in a small way. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Molly. Thank you, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Molly Morrison. I'm a resident of District 5, and I'm also Chief Development Officer for iCivics. So I'm here in both a personal and professional capacity to, endo to endorse the proposed expansion of the civics requirement. So let me tell you a little bit about iCivics. I know Natasha mentioned us earlier. 
Uh, iCivics is based right, over, right across the river in Cambridge. Um, we are the largest provider of civic curriculum in the nation. All of our curriculum and resources are entirely free and digitally accessible. Right now, we have 100,000 teachers who are using our games and resources to teach 6 million students in all 50 states about everything to do with how our political process works. That includes 700 teachers in the Boston area alone. We were founded 10 years ago by retired Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, who even 10 years ago was gravely concerned about the lack of understanding of how our government works and the disenfranchisement that inevitably follows and that we see today. She understood the importance of education to the health of our democracy, and she would often say, without knowledge, how can citizens meaningfully participate? Her vision was to ensure that every young person develops the knowledge, skills, and enthusiasm, which we've all mentioned is quite important, for active and thoughtful participation in civic life. Gone is the dry, wrote civics of old. We don't do that anymore. iCivics wants to make civic education relevant to new generations of citizens. So we create educational video games and classroom resources that teach children to understand how government works by actually being able to take part in it. We are best known for our 20 games that we've developed to engage students in scenarios that teach them about the various roles of our public officials, including local officials, as well as addre addressing other key educational issues like media literacy. Our newest game, Race to Ratify, released just last week, teaches students about the issues debated during the founding period of the Constitution, issues that continue to resonate in public debate today. As has been said previously, the case for improved civic education is clear. It has long been implemented inconsistently, both here and elsewhere, and frankly, nationally, it's been blatantly neglected for years. State testing and competition with other priorities have taken a severe toll over the decades, and we can see the result of that data today and in our day-to-day -day life. Lack of understanding about how our government works and the principles of our democracy is driving the low participation we see from young people today um, in everything from voting to community life and just a general cynicism cynicism uh, about our collective civic life. Most troubling of all, current research clearly indicates that students who most need to learn about how civic life works so that they can better advocate for themselves and their communities consistently have the least access to high quality instruction. But there is hope, as we see here today. iCivics and many other organizations who are represented here are working in close participation with Boston Public Schools, both with Natasha Scott, Josue Sakata, and many other officials there. Um, to build a robust um, field of study and to bring this life-altering experience to students. We've heard a lot about this, civics in action. You know, not just learning, but doing. Um, so this school year, iCivics has partnered with the Boston Public Schools with funding from NBC Boston to help what we've called uh, the Activate Civics Project. And it's to not only teach uh, how to use our resources to teach the knowledge base of civic education, but actually to link them with local causes and organizations so they can actually take part and learn their agency for change. So we are at the moment of over 18 schools throughout the city are taking part in that program. And we'll be celebrating that on June 6th for anybody who would like to attend at the EMK Institute. This initiative and many others throughout this district are very timely. Nationally, such projects are riding a wave of renewed commitment to civic life. We have never seen so much interest in this topic as we have in the last year or so. A recent national report found that even where we can agree on nothing in this country, 89% of people support more access to civic education. That is a bright spot. In Massachusetts, as we know, we are now leading the way, thanks to the uh, new law that was passed last November. Um, and we really have an incredible opportunity here to take it to the next level and let Boston be a shining example to other cities. We really hope that Boston will do just that, and we applaud the councilors for taking the leadership for this. I want to thank everyone, both for your commitment to public service, and thank you for your thoughtful consideration of this proposal. We really hope you'll take swift, swift action to approve it. Uh, Molly, can I just ask, sure. is your curriculum or is the iCivics um, curriculum available to the general public or just yes, teaching it's, it's, staff? Uh, nope, so we have, uh, children can go on and play the games directly if they'd like to. Oh, that's great. It's all free. Uh, for teachers, it's entirely free. We just have a login process just so that we can communicate with them about what's there. But there are no barriers to participation. That's great. And is there any, um, are, there, are any of your resources available internationally? We've had a lot of demand for that in the last few years as well. Um, our goal is to get it right in the US and to reach uh, all students in America, which we consider about 10 million. We look at the number of classes they have each year in middle and high school. But it is something we're considering. That's great. 
a uh, number of European countries, South Africa, Australia have been interested. Well, I appreciate the video game piece because when, <laughs> when the boys ask me tonight for video games, I'm going to say I've got just the website. There for you it. go. <laughs> See, no guilt. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Great. Thank Thanks. you very much. Uh, next, we have Elizabeth Sanchez and Samantha Perlman. And then uh, last up will be Ann Gogol. Good afternoon, distinguished city council members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in front of you uh, here today. My name is Elizabeth Sanchez. I'm a constituent who lives on Meeting House Hill in Dorchester, the program manager of an action civics organization called Generation Citizen, which you've heard a lot about. Um, and we work in like a little over a dozen uh, Boston public schools. And I'm here to advocate for the prioritization of civics education in schools across the city of Boston. A couple of weeks ago, I read an article in The Globe about a young man named Kendrick Price. Kendrick had done all the right things. He succeeded throughout his life, overcoming the stigmas that young men of color raised in Dorchester often get. Went to a great college in Michigan on scholarship, graduated in three years, became a financial analyst, and had started a job in Dorchester working with youth from his community. Unfortunately, his life was cut short by gunshots near his home, which happens to be a couple blocks away from mine. As I read this article while feeling absolute devastation about Kendrick, I also thought about the countless times I've seen my students work on civics projects on the topic of gun violence and heard their experiences with this issue. For many Boston students, civics isn't just a course to learn about government. It can also be a potential solution towards removing the threats that affect their families, communities, and their success. It's not just gun violence. I've seen students from Josiah Quincy Upper School in Chinatown working on issues of affordable housing, students from the McKay K-8 in Eastie work on immigration policies, students at Orchard Gardens K-8 in Roxbury request the removal of opioid needles out of their school playground for over a year. Our students deserve to know the ways in which they can impact the systems that affect them every single day. They deserve to know where power lies, have the skills to advocate for the issues they see around them, uh, and be motivated to participate in our city and beyond as engaged, active citizens. Civics is also one of the best ways to provide young people with tools through developing their literacy skills. Members of the council, how much of your effectiveness as civic leaders depends on your ability to speak and write eloquently, critically analyze proposals, and to conduct deliberations? We ask our students to grow these 21st century skills in school, but how much more motivated would they be if, like you, they knew that they were speaking and writing to advance the good of their communities and their families. I believe that while we need to ensure civics is happening in schools for longer than a semester, we also need to ensure that civics is done in an effective way. We need to, we need to make sure that every one of our schools has a dedicated civics teacher, that those teachers have opportunities for professional development and access to civics curriculum. We need funds for schools to engage in this work and we need to make space for young people at tables and on boards where policy is made. Currently, the Boston Public Schools History Department has two amazing staff uh, who are dedicated to supporting social studies, history, and civics courses for 135 schools in the district. We need an additional staff member or more uh, in the district who can oversee civics education expansion for years to come. Boston has often led the way towards progressive education reform. Investing in civics education for our students is another way to continue to lead the path towards equitable education and to create a model that other cities and states can follow. Esteemed counselors, I hope you will join me in ensuring that Boston youth receive the civics education, ed education they deserve. Thank you for, to committee chair Sibi George, uh, sponsor of this hearing, Councilor Garrison, and the rest of the council members for your time. Thank you, Elizabeth. Samantha. Good afternoon, and thank you so much to committee chair Asabi George and a sponsor of a searing Councilor Garrison and the rest of the council. My name is Samantha Perlman, and I'm the senior program associate for Generation Citizen, an action civics organization who you've heard of uh, so far today. I'm a graduate of Massachusetts Public Schools myself and had a wonderful experience taking a government course when I was in high school um, that has led me to pursue a career now in government and civic engagement, and so definitely want to speak to the value of these opportunities for our young people. I'm thankful for the opportunity to speak today about strengthening Boston civic education through increased frequency and funding to support such implementation. 
When I think about civics, I think back to other subjects in my own career, English, math, and science, which have consecutive learning years uh, with the aim of working towards skill mastery, such as needing to know how to read and grammar rules before analyzing literature and writing essays. Think back to your own experience as a student and how each year you progressed in these subjects. By taking a subject year, area each year, you built off initial knowledge gained and then took on more complex content and skills. We learned by practicing, honing our skills, and through experiential learning, which was showcased by many other people here today. The same is true of civics, even though it is often a course taught once, if at all, in our current public schools. How can students graduate from school knowing all aspects of participating in our democracy if we do not provide enough opportunities for them to build their civic skills, knowledge, and motivation during their K through 12 education? Learning about government and systems in our democracy at the local, state, and federal level through civics courses are necessary for sustained civic engagement. I have seen how civics education that is experiential and real world can achieve individual and collective transformation in how students understand their role in the community. It is the door to more civic engagement and for students to improve the systems that impact their lives. I want to share a few stories of youth civic projects through Generation Citizen that highlight such engagement. Students in Brighton were concerned about their rapidly gentrifying neighborhood. In their civics class, they advocated for a state bill to increase funding for affordable housing. Several students from this civics class then testified at the Senate Committee on Bonding, Capital Expenditures, and State Assets in support of a House bill, an act financing the production and preservation of housing for low and moderate income residents. Robust, real world, and hands-on civic education is what made that possible. In another Boston civics class, students advocated for adding body cameras to the Boston Police Department to address the issue of racial profiling in their area. Initially, students were disengaged. They knew racial profiling was an issue in Boston, but did not know how to advocate for systemic change. By calling elected officials in their class directly and doing the research, students were empowered to ask questions, tell stories about their experiences, and help inform policy that impacted them directly. Through such action civics education, students dissected an important issue in their lives, researched the root cause, and started connecting with community leaders. Most important, students learned how to be civic change agents themselves. Although there are amazing things happening in the Boston Public Schools, and these are great examples, there are not enough opportunities yet to reach all students. In action civics that we do is only occurring in a dozen schools, and there needs to be more. Civics education in Boston is more than just a class for our students, as my colleague mentioned earlier. It is a bridge connecting their experiences in the community to what they are learning in the classroom. It is skill building, communication, debate, consensus, writing, critical thinking, public speaking, teamwork, and organization. If we do not provide sufficient opportunities for students to engage in civics, where will they hone and refine the world world value of these skills? Young people continue to be at the forefront of change in our democracy, such as through recent movements to tackle gun violence and climate change. The time for more civic education is now. Already, Massachusetts is a leader with the passage of the recent landmark civics legislation that sets a framework for all schools in the Commonwealth to teach American history and civics, provide every student with civic-led civic projects at both, at both middle and high school, and provide voter education in an eighth grade statewide civics education. Boston has an incredible opportunity to be a model for how a district and a city can take the reins of the new civics legislation to full implementation. We are already seeing cities in other states take on this call for civic education. Recently, New York City has come to the forefront with Mayor de Blasio's and the Department of Education's initiative called Civics for All. The city is infusing tremendous resources into citywide civics curriculum development and professional development to completely reform civic education in the city. It is exciting to see other cities take on this important issue and a wonderful opportunity for Boston to emerge as the leader in civic education in Massachusetts. If we were to provide comp comprehensive civic education for all students, we need to set our teachers up for success. Currently, many social studies classes in BPS are taught by teachers who are not certified to teach social studies and civics. Our district history department is understaffed uh, and needs more funding to provide district-wide professional development to civics teachers. Any new policy reforms taken up the, by the council must also call for investments in these resources needed by teachers to provide high-quality civic education. Educating for citizenship is a foundational responsibility of American public schools, and here in Boston, we have such an opportunity to enrich our students' relationships to their community through comprehensive civic education. I am pleased to see the council uh, sparking important dialogue in civic, about civic education through this hearing and look forward to working with the council to implement the Civic Education Bill's vision. Thank you for your time and leadership as we improve Boston civic education and empower our young people. Thank you.
thank you both. I've spent um, some time in a few of your classrooms across the yeah. city, and you've got some of the greatest um, or the most engaged kids. Um, and I know they exist in other classrooms as well, but you, you guys have created an environment in your uh, Generation Citizens classroom. And we had an intern, I think, last summer. Yes, um, yes. thank you so, so it's much. Really great. Yeah. No, it's really, really wonderful what you're doing. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And then Anne Gogol. Good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity to talk about civic education, this very, very important topic in our city. My name is Ann Gogol, and I am the Chief Operating Officer and Acting Executive Director at Discovering Justice. We are a K-8 civic ed, uh, civic and justice organization located in the Moakley U.S. Courthouse here in Boston. Um, we've been providing civic education to students across the city of Boston and across the Commonwealth for over 20 years now. And uh, as an organization, we all feel quite passionately about the importance of civic education, particularly when it comes to young people. And as you know, we work with students beginning in kindergarten, so particularly very young people. Um, Natasha Scott introduced us briefly during her presentation. Uh, we are strong, committed partners with BPS and have worked closely with Natasha and her team, uh, providing our curriculum to educators and students across the city of Boston. Today we've heard uh, countless reasons why civic education is important. There can be no doubt that civic education is important, particularly now. Um, and so I thought rather than reiterating some of the things we've already heard, I'll just add a few more points and briefly talk about um, some additional reasons why I think civic education is important. Um, I said earlier we work with young students, um, but it is certainly important for older students as well. And uh, civic education is frequently uh, an overlooked way to, I'm sorry, civic education is a frequently overlooked way to address the vast educational achievement gap in our country. According to the glossary of education reform, college-bound students require the development of 21st century skills like leadership and collaboration, oral and written communication, creativity, problem solving and critical thinking, adaptability and social justice literacy to succeed in today's world. The 2009 report, Paths to 21st Century, competencies through civic education classrooms asserts civic education, particularly when it is interactive and involves discussion of current issues, is an important way to develop the skills that young Americans need to succeed. According to a Gallup study, effective civic learning practices influence student motivation and consequently student and school engagement, which yields academic benefits. Gallup found student hope and engagement are significant predictors of academic achievement, with a one percentage point increase in a student's score on the engagement index associated with a six point increase in reading achievement and an eight point increase in math achievement scores. So for a variety of reasons, civic education is important. And uh, at Discovering Justice, we enthusiastically support additional civic education for students across BPS. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I do, before I close this hearing, I do want to just make a note of a letter that I received from uh, the Boston Student Advisory Council President, uh, Stanley Aniki. And um, I just am going to uh, just pull out a small selection of uh, what he shared. It will be uh, submitted for the, for the record. Uh, but in his letter, he writes, on behalf of the student, Boston Student Advisory Council, as well as youth on board, we believe in civics education in Boston classrooms. We believe the civic education in Boston classrooms should match the level of rich civic education afforded to youth outside of them. A full year requirement for civic education would, would help do that and allow for more time for students to create a meaningful civics, meaningful civic projects in school, as mentioned in the civic education bill. It will encourage more young people to be civically engaged and to educate others about the importance of being responsible citizens. In closing, the expansion of the requirement would only enhance and further deepen civic engagement among Boston's youth. 
We're thankful for the conversation on this very important topic and look forward to engaging in further discussion. Um, so I just wanted to share that and it will be submitted for the record. Uh, Councilor Garrison, do you have any closing comments? Um, I'm just waiting for my bill to be passed so we can get involved in civic education. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Garrison. Uh, uh, welcome, Superintendent Perel. I don't know if you've got comments about before I gavel out, but uh, thank you for being here. I, I was hoping to catch at least a little bit, so my apologies. We'll share, we'll share the link with you. Thank you, and your team um, will certainly fill you in. Thank you very much. This meeting is adjourned.